It's like the calm before the storm. It's like it's like um, the verdict is going to be is is coming out in just a couple of hours because that's when Powell's coming out with his interest rate decision. And we kind of all know what the interest rate decision is. There's no big uh, surprises coming up from the interest rate decision. The question is how the markets will respond and how you should be positioning yourself. That's what we're going to talk about today. Also today, I'm going to give you like going to give you like three pieces of advice, crypto advice. Probably the best three pieces of crypto advice that you're ever going to get. So I'm going to give you one piece of crypto advice now, and then I'm going to give you two pieces of crypto advice at the end of the show. And what I want you to do is I want you to tell me which one of the pieces of crypto advice is the best piece of crypto advice that you received in the show. Is it the first one, which I'm about to give you now before we start the show, or is it going to be one of the, the other ones, one of the other ones, which I'm going to give you later. So the best piece of crypto advice that I can give you right now is if you're ever lying in bed next to your wife on a Saturday night and the phantom price starts coming down, the token phantom, it, the price starts coming down. The best piece of advice that I can give you, if your wife is sitting next to your girlfriend or whatever else, the best piece of advice that I can give you, and trust me about this advice is whatever you do, don't go to Twitter and use the search and search FTM without the dollar sign. Because if you do, your wife or your girlfriend will think you're an absolute maniac. Now, if you like that piece of advice, well, follow me for more financial advice on Twitter and join the show because there's two more pieces of financial advice. Remember, remember, remember that. Uh, yo, 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 Banter fam. So I am here. Uh, I'm not feeling great. Uh, my throat's a bit sore. I did test for COVID. I don't have COVID, but I'm going to be sipping tea. I've got this husky voice going. Um, let me know what you thought of that, that piece of advice that I gave you. I think it could be quite handy. Um, how I found out about the advice was very simple. I was lying in bed next to my wife on Saturday night, and the price of Phantom was going down, and I wanted to know what the hell was going on on the price of Phantom. So what did I do? I go to Twitter, and here, you see, I go to Twitter, and all I did was I go to Twitter, yeah, I'll show you what I did. I'm not going to show you the screenshot. For those of you who've been there, you'll know why I'm not about to show you the screenshot. And then, like, very innocently, what I did was I just, like, searched FTM. Just hit the search bar, FTM. Okay, now, my suggestion to you is never do that. Never, ever, ever do that. Because, I mean, if you've done it, you'll know. You'll, if you've done it, you'll know. If you've done it, you'll know. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hectic. My wife, I think she, she looked at me, she goes, she went like, what the fuck is wrong with you? What are you looking at? What are you watching at? So yeah, that's probably the best alpha you're going to get today on any YouTube channel, um, especially today, especially today. All right, let's do this with a bad voice. First of all, remember today, uh, in about a couple of, oh my God, this thing's open and I'm now watching what it's, oh, oh it's disgusting. Um, okay, yeah, yeah well, I'm not putting, I'm not putting that though, I'm not putting it. Um, what was I saying? Oh, I was saying, remember that tonight at 2.25 EST, we're going live. Sheldino is going to be with us. We're going to be live and we're going to be watching uh, Powell give his press conference after the interest rate increase. We know what the interest rate increase is going to be. And we're going to be watching live with you guys. So pack your, your, your popcorn and your whiskey or whatever you do at that, that time. And uh, yeah, let's do it together. Let's have a viewing party together. We'll just be together. So we'll, there will be a link drop here. Uh, on the YouTube channel. Join us for that. Join us for that. All right, let's talk, look at um, what can happen. And remember, if you are new to the channel, subscribe to the channel. Also like this content. Uh, in the bear market, it's very, very, very hard for us to get views. You know that the interest in crypto is going down. And the only people that are left are actually fucking legends. So, um, and the problem is that there's not a lot of fucking legends in the world. There's very few fucking legends in the world. So you need to like this content because that's how we get out there. Today, I'm also going to be giving away $10,000 on the show. So I'm giving away $10,000, excluding the Bybit money, which I'm going to give away. And I've got great news for you guys when it comes to the Bybit money. Uh, I'm going to give away $10,000 um, from a great protocol. The protocol is called CoinWeb. It's a layer two, um, it's a layer two interoperability layer um, for dApps. Very, very, very good project. Uh, I'm going to give away $10,000 of a token. I'm going to show you guys how to do that. But you've got to be a subscriber and you've got to like this content. So let's do it. Let's look at the markets. Um, so the NASDAQ is kind of telling us that it is nervous. It is super nervous ahead of uh, the Jerome Powell uh, FOMC meeting and, uh, and the press conference afterwards. The futures are down about 161 points, which is about 1.27%. We did see something quite interesting with Bitcoin. So Bitcoin 
yesterday was trading at about 37,500. And then a whole lot of whales, we think it's whales because we, what we did was we went and looked at the wallets. And what you can see is that the wallets, the, the wallets of accounts with 1,000 Bitcoin plus and 10,000 Bitcoin plus, if you zoom in, what you'll see is that these wallets are actually starting to accumulate Bitcoin again. So what we saw yesterday was we saw the Bitcoin price dip to 37,500, 37,800, somewhere around there. And then a whole lot of buying started to happen. And that, what that started to do was that started to get a whole lot of shorts liquidated. So if you looked at the patient data, all of a sudden you started seeing a whole lot of shorts get liquidated. And so what that's telling you is that there are a lot of people who are short going into this FOMC meeting. Now, if Powell comes out tonight and he is dovish and he is positive, then we could see the, the, the ultimate short squeeze. And what that could do is it could take Bitcoin up to anywhere between 44 and 46,000. But we have to look past that. We have to look past the FOMC meeting because it's almost like what we've done is we've, we've fixated ourselves on this FOMC meeting. And we've kind of forgotten that regardless of what happens on the FOMC meeting, life goes on after the FOMC meeting. We know at this FOMC meeting that there's a 96.8% chance that Powell increases interest rates by 50 basis points. No one's disputing that. That's pretty much a fact. Okay. But we take the view that even though right now um, we, everyone is bearish, because everyone is bearish, because we had a miss on the GDP numbers, because everyone's bearish, because we had a negative GDP growth, because the employment numbers were not as good as the employment numbers were supposed to be. I think there is a good chance that Powell comes out with a 50 basis point rate hike and he comes out pretty dovish, pretty um, positive, less aggressive about future rate hikes. Now, why, why that's interesting is because right now the market's seriously scared. And I'll show you this now. So the market's seriously scared. The market is pricing in 10.2 rate hikes by the end of 2022. Okay, so that's what the market is currently pricing in. This is what that looks like visually. So visually, if you look at where we're, where we're at now, the market is pricing in 10 rate hikes, which is pretty much rate hikes every single, um, every single Fed meeting. Now, let's look at that against the reality of what could actually happen. The last time that the Fed raised interest rates by 50 basis points was, I think, in 2002, let me just check it. Let me just check the data here. Um, okay, I don't have that data, but I think the last time that the Fed raised in interest rates by 50 basis points was 2002. I don't think that the Fed has ever raised interest rates by, by 50 basis points back to back. So 50 basis points now and 50 basis points in June. What the market is pricing in right now is the market is pricing in a 50 basis point rate hike now and then another 50 basis point rate hike in June with the, prob with the probability of a 75 basis point rate hike in, um, in June. I think that what's going on now is that the market is being overly negative. The market is pricing in too many rate hikes. It's never happened in history that we've had so many rate hikes so aggressively back to back. And that is what the market is starting to price in now. So why I say we should look beyond the Fed meeting because yes there's a fed meeting time but let's look beyond the fed meeting while the market is fixated on tonight's meeting let's let's look a little bit forward so the fed increases interest rates by 50 basis points two things are going to happen one is the economy is going to slow down we already had one quarter of gdp growth remember that the numbers for the next quarter are going to come out in april may june so sometime in probably july the numbers are going to come out for the second quarter and we're going to see probably a contraction and probably we're going to be in officially in a recession. At the same time, what people are forgetting is that in a week, we're going to get the interest rate numbers. We're going to get the, 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 the uh, inflation numbers. And what people are forgetting is that the inflation numbers in April are compared to the inflation numbers of April last year. So remember, inflation is year-on-year year inflation. So it's like you take April last year versus April this year, you compare the two and you say, okay, the prices in April this year went up uh, um, uh, relative to the price of, in April this year. Let's look at what happened last year, because this is important. So if you look at March 2020, 
sorry, if you look at, let's go to 2021. In 2021 March, the inflation rate was 2.6%. In 2021 April, the inflation was 4.2%, which means that the base became pretty high. So here's what I think is going to happen. I think the Fed increases by 50 basis points. The Fed has already corrected the markets by 14%. The NASDAQ is down 14%. And if we look at what that means relative to other months, uh, I hope I got this one for you guys here. Uh, I don't have this chart for you guys. But if we look at what it means, I think it's like the 13th biggest uh, down month for the NASDAQ ever in the history of the NASDAQ. So it's a, a serious down month uh, in the NASDAQ. And now you're going to get the inflation numbers. And I think that the inflation numbers are going to be pretty stagnant and even down. Not because I think the Fed is doing a great job, but I think because people have stopped spending and because I think that the base this year is much higher. And so I think that the, the net effect of that, plus the US moving into recession, says to the Fed, hold on a second. You can't increase. I know you think that you can increase uh, interest rates. If, uh, I know the market's pricing in 0.5 plus 0.5 plus 0.5 plus 0.5. But the reality is that the market can't afford that. The market can't stomach that. And so what I think we're in now is I think we're heading for a positive surprise. And I think that positive surprise will be we raised by 0.5. The economy slows down. Inflation comes under control. And then in June, whereas everyone's talking about 0.75, I think we may see 0.25. And then I think the Fed adopts a much more realistic approach. And yeah, and I think if that happens, then we could see the market going down. We also have to remember that the Fed, the government, the US is all about narratives. Everything is around the narrative. So the first narrative was inflation is transitory. The next narrative was, okay, the inflation is here to stay, but it's driven by supply side inflation. Now it's called Putin inflation. So they're talking about this thing called Putin inflation. It's caused by the Russia-Ukraine war. But now there's a new narrative coming out. There's a new narrative coming out of, uh, out of Wall Street. And the narrative is that the lockdowns in Shanghai are reigniting supply chain problems. Who could have predicted that? Carl didn't predict that. I told you guys ages ago that it's going to happen. And so now what you've got is you've got all these ships. This is a heat map of all the cargo ships which are outside of Shanghai. Okay. The port is so big, it is so pulled up here that some of these ships are even parking on land, according to this map. No, I'm kidding. The, 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 ships aren't park, the ships aren't parking on land. I promise you they're not. So what you can see here is that you've got this backup. This backup means it's going to be harder to get supplies. And when it becomes harder to get supplies, what's going to happen is that the price of things is going to go up, and that's going to cause more inflation, but also more of an economic slowdown. So you're going to have this economic slowdown when the U.S. economy has already contracted by negative 1.4%. Uh, and let me tell you, the last thing that the Biden administration wants in the midterm election year is to go into midterm elections with an economy that's in a recession and high inflation with, with prices going up. So I think that we're going to get our 50 basis points tonight. But that's about it. And I think from then on, we're going to go into maybe another 50 and maybe another uh, 0.25 after that. And the Fed isn't going to be as aggressive as they keep saying that they're going to be. It's just not going to happen. I think we're going to come back to reality. Let me see. Let, let's see if I'm right. Um, I think I did see something about that over here. Let's have a look. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that's it. What we are seeing, though, is that at these levels, whales are starting to accumulate Bitcoin again. And that hasn't always been the case. So what we can see is the red dots here are whales. So every time that the whales accumulate here, you can see that the whales are starting to accumulate again here. So I checked this against the data, the, the actual on-chain data. And if you look at the on-chain data, let me try and drag this show you guys. So if you look at the on-chain data, what you can see is you've got this spike again in whales accumulating. They were selling. They were selling. And now you've got this spike again of them accumulating. They got, you got the spike of, of whales accumulating. So I think all in all, what I've done today is I've positioned myself for a dovish slash bullish Fed meeting. I've taken a long position on the, on the NASDAQ, a leveraged long position on the NASDAQ, taken a slightly leveraged long position on Bitcoin, which I don't usually do. I've got a very strict stop loss because, you know, I'm not really a trader, so I'm, I'm, I'm in uncharted territory for me. Um, I've taken a very, very, very strict uh, stop loss because I think if that happens, we could get the short squeeze. And if we get the short squeeze, then Bitcoin can go up, could go up to 46,000 quite easily. 
Let me know what you think. I mean, maybe it's opium. Maybe it's not. Anyway, I've, put, I've placed my bets. Right, down, right now, my short is slightly down. But I'm doing it for later tonight where you guys will join me. We'll, we'll actually, later on, what we'll do is we'll watch the markets while, while Powell is talking. So we'll have both screens up and we'll watch how the one-minute charts move when Powell's talking. It'll be amazing. It'll be a lot of fun. All right. Um, there was also some news about uh, Bitcoin ETF. So the SEC came out again and kind of laid the path for a Bitcoin ETF. And they said, look, if you want a Bitcoin ETF, this is what we want. So I want you guys to hear this because it infuriates me. I think it will infuriate you. But let's listen to it together. Hopefully CNBC doesn't make us watch one of their crummy ads. If you can't come to us, we'll come to you. Need an so I'm going to mute that and we can just talk about other things. So, so we can definitely talk about other things. Um, there's also good news for DeFi. Very, very, very good news for DeFi, which I want to share with you guys. Um, I don't know if you guys remember. Oh, here it is. Hold on. Let's, let's, let's do this first. So let's talk about, let's listen to the ETF news on CNBC. Everyone still speculating and about Bitcoin. Uh, you recently received. So just quickly for, for context, this guy over here is from the company that got the Bitcoin futures ETF approved. And remember, they got it approved under the new rule. It's a, it's a slightly different rule. Uh, I think it's called Rule 32 or Rule 30. L listen to this interview. Approval for a Bitcoin futures ETF. And of course, everyone still speculating endlessly that the SEC may someday approve a spot Bitcoin ETF. Maybe this year, maybe not. Uh, now, what's interesting is the SEC's approval letter, letter to you uh, contained a footnote, which you believe clearly spells out what the Bitcoin community needs to do to get approval for that spot Bitcoin ETF. What did what was said in this letter to you? The SEC clearly laid out in footnote number 46, for those who, who are looking at the document, where they want the crypto exchanges to mimic the other exchanges in that they have a comprehensive surveillance agreement, meaning they're watching for bad actors. The SEC is all about investor protection. They're, they know there are bad actors out there. They want to be able to spot them. So they've clearly spelled out that if the crypto exchanges put in those surveillance agreements and then institute those comprehensive surveillance agreements with the ETF listing exchanges, they will get a crypto spot ETF. I don't think it's going to happen because I don't see why those big crypto exchanges would want to centralize when the whole industry is right. made up of the, the decentralized exactly. concept. They've set up, a, I mean, this is a real problem. You, you, isn't this the problem that, that this centralizes a business that's supposed to be decentralized, right? I mean, why would crypto exchanges agree uh, to submit themselves to the regulation the SEC says they want when the purpose is to be decentralized. It's, I, I don't know, right. it's a con conundrum. It, it is, and really the people who want to spot Bitcoin ETF for ease of access to ETF, they're the people that are getting shortchanged here because nobody has a motivation um, to, to, to centralize themselves that's in the crypto industry. So in a nutshell, what the SEC is saying is saying, look, you want a Bitcoin spot ETF, then you've got to almost regulate with us. And so if you give us information, then we will give you guys a spot ETF. And they're kind of holding this gun to the head in this footnote. And they're trying to take a decentralized service and trying, trying to make it mimic the centralized service providers, which is exactly what we're, we're moving away from. So you've now got Grayscale threatening to sue the SEC, which I think is just a lot of noise because if they do, that'll take years and years and years. But according to this interview, and I think it's true, we're probably not going to see a Bitcoin spot ETF um, we're not going to see it for a while, which is which is a big pity, which is a big pity. Unless the SEC comes out. It's exactly, it's blackmail. Thomas, you said it right. So I'm drinking tea for my throat. Mm. Let's talk about some other insane news. I don't know if you guys remember. Hold on. Let me see if my researcher can remind you guys, because I've got a good research and I think he might be able to remind you guys. Uh, hold on. Let's go. Uh, okay. He says from the 22nd. So basically, I've been saying to you guys for a while that I think the next narrative is going to be institutional DeFi. And the reason why I think it's going to be institutional DeFi is because I said to you guys last year, November, and I said it to you guys again in January when I spelled out what I think my top five um, narratives were going to be for this year. I said layer ones were going to be a huge narrative. I said that uh, privacy was going to be a huge narrative, but I also said that institutional DeFi was going to be a huge, it is Roy Bush T. Roland, um, a, a huge narrative. And now what we're seeing for the first time 
is we're seeing a major shift to institutional DeFi. You've got to pay attention. You've got to pay attention to the undertone of what's happening. Even though the markets are coming down, never in my wildest dreams when I spoke about institutional DeFi, never in my wildest dreams did I think that it was going to be U.S. pension fund money coming into DeFi. Okay? So I never believed for a second that the institutional money that was going to come into DeFi was going to be pension fund money. But now you've got Virginia pension funds talking about getting into crypto yield farming. And they're doing that because they're not getting returns in the market. There's no more returns in the market. But they, they do know that there are lots of returns in DeFi. So they're saying two new hedge funds will utilize standalone yield farming strategies. Yield farming provides, so this is, the first thing is you're getting pension funds now starting to slowly move into DeFi. Last year, they moved into Bitcoin. Now they're starting to move into DeFi. It's exactly what happened to you and I. So you come here for DeFi, then you move on to, you come here for Bitcoin, then you move into altcoins, Ethereum, then you move into altcoins, then you start to become a DeFi degen. What we also saw yesterday was we saw MicroStrategy reporting their numbers. Okay, so let's look at the numbers here. I should have the numbers here. Um, okay, MicroStrategy lost $170 million in their results. Now, the reason why they lost $170 million was because the Bitcoin fluctuations, the Bitcoin fluctuated. And in the US, there's a law that says how you treat the accounting of Bitcoin on your balance sheet, if you're a listed company, any company, is if the price goes up, you don't mark up the price. But if the price goes down, you've got to write down the price. So you accrue a loss. So what happened to Pro Micro Strategy? They clocked up $170.1 million loss on their Bitcoin, which makes their results look bad. Ironically, the 170 million is more than their actual revenue. So just think about like what that means. It means that the revenue that they made from trading was less than 170 million dollars, but they lost 170 million dollars because the Bitcoin price went up, down. If the Bitcoin price goes up next quarter, they can't mark it up and say, "Oh, we made 170 million dollars." And that's the disincentive in the United States for companies to be buying Bitcoin, so and and putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet. The only companies that are doing it are companies like Tesla, because they believe it's square, they believe it, MicroStrategy. What we're also seeing in micro, from MicroStrategy, which I think is super encouraging, you'll recall that when I interviewed Michael Saylor and when many other people have interviewed Michael Saylor, the one thing we asked him is, would you take your Bitcoin and go and get yield on your Bitcoin? Would you start farming your coins? And at the time, he said, absolutely not. He said, look, I'm in Bitcoin to make 10,000% return over five years. And to make an extra four or 5% by, by loaning out my Bitcoin is not worth the, the headache and the risk of moving coins from wallet to wallet, et cetera. But now the tune has changed. So they lose money and they came out and they said, may conservatively explore yield generation opportunities on unencumbered macro strategy coins. So there is a narrative brewing of institutional DeFi. You have to see that this narrative is coming. We had institutions coming to Bitcoin last year. This year, they're coming into DeFi. And so position yourself to get the returns from that. So, you know, we bought Credo, Credo because we thought that was a, a good institutional DeFi play. But there are lots of others. So I think what we'll do is we'll start doing some shows around, um, around institutional DeFi. The last thing that happened, was, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I do think it's flipping good news. Flipping good, that's so bad. Um, <laughs> is that the IMF, IMF wrote a report. So they have what they call a global stability report. Okay, now the global stability report is like basically when they talk about how stable the world is and how amazing it is. And the first thing they did was they acknowledged DeFi. They acknowledged the presence of DeFi. Not only that, they said that DeFi is more efficient than traditional fire, but it does have higher risks, which is obviously, it's obvious. Obviously, if you're going to have a new industry that is still developing, obviously it's gonna have higher risks because there's hacks and whatever else, and they mentioned all of this in the report. But the main thing is what they said, and I think it's, I think I can find it for you guys here. Um, this year, IMF did find that DeFi is super cost efficient compared to traditional fire in developed and emerging markets. And this is a, a, a huge finding. And they continued with this and they did a whole lot of analyses in terms of the efficiency. And they said, 
With the efficiency, obviously, comes higher risk. But they said that DeFi is much more efficient and much, much more cost effective. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that in the span of a week, we would hear of a pension fund moving into DeFi. We would hear of micro, micro strategy moving into DeFi. And then the IMF in the World Stability Report, which is, I think, one of the most important reports for people who like reading reports. Um, and now they're talking about how efficient DeFi is relative to traditional FI. Okay. And yeah, I just want to see if there's anything else that I want to show you here. And I think that's it. I think that, that pretty much sums it up. So there is, I said it in, in November, and I'm saying it again now, there is an institutional DeFi narrative that's coming. Um, they want 20% returns. They want 20% returns on Anchor Protocol. Well, they're not going to get 20%. They're going to get 18%. You know why they're going to get 18%? Because Anchor Protocol reduced its yield from 19.5 to now 18%. And what happened? Well, for a couple of minutes today, they got to $20 billion total value locked. So not only did money not leave, but more money came in. Okay, now the total value lock, locked is 19.912. So, okay. It's, I mean, it is the highest that it's ever been. So just look at where we're at. Institutions are coming. They want your 20%. They want our 20%. All right, let's move on because there's so much I want to talk to you guys about. It's, I don't know, so much to talk about. Okay. You saw this, right? Everyone saw this. Everyone saw this. Yes, what is this? This is the ApeCoin chart. Okay. This here is the point where our man Elon Musk changes his profile picture to a collage of the board apes. So let's look at that. Okay, now it is rumored that he actually owns uh, some board apes and he takes a picture of this thing and then ApeCoin jumps up like this and Run sees this. So Run goes and takes a short at $16.80 and uh, short position still open, by the way. Now, I didn't know why it was going to come down, but the reason why it came down is because like five minutes after he posted the, the original, he then posted and he said, I don't know, seems kind of fungible. And what he meant was, like, I, I think you all know, you all think that you own this amazing piece of artwork, but look, I just copied the whole collage of uh, bored apes and put them on my timeline. That's basically what he did. So now the price is back, but the price is still not back down to where it was before the whole thing started. So it's, he's like, now, last year, he played this game with Doge, remember, with all the retail investors? Now, playing the game with ApeCoin. He's found a new toy. He went from dogs to apes. Um, yeah, so that's what happened. But what also happened in, in that hour where he did this, we saw a surge in the sale of apes. We got 22 plus bored apes sold and selling it at a much higher floor prices. So it's exactly what he did with Doge last year. And I think he might even come back and say, you know what, I actually do own an ape or something along those lines. He is, um, he is rumored to own an ape. I think it is ape number... I uh, can't remember which number, but he is, he is, he, he does own an ape, or people think that he owns an ape. Um, speaking of ape, um, remember that there was speculation after this whole failed e thing that ape would go onto their own chain. And I said, I think it's a very bad idea. If, if it does, if ape does go to their own chain off Ethereum and become a, a side chain, I think the ape coin goes to zero, not zero, but very close to zero. Anyway, um, the DAO has confirmed that right now there is no, um, no talk of moving to their own chain. So Yatsu, who's the founder of Animoca Brands, he also sits on the governance board of a DAI, says, um, while Yuga Labs encourages a DAI to think of um, uh, migrating to a new chain, Yatsu said there was no discussion amongst the DAI members nor with the parties about that possibility of an ape chain. So right now, they're not doing it. I think it's very, 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 very smart they're not doing it. Um, I did also want to show you something else. I've said this before a million times, I'm going to say it to you guys again now. There is a movement now by NFT DGENs. And what the NFT DGENs are doing now is, NFT DGENs are like you and I, but they just trade NFTs all day long. They just trade NFTs all day long. All day long they trade NFTs. I've got NFT DGENs sitting in my office. You want to see what a DGEN looks like? I'll show you what a DGEN looks like. I'm not going to mention names because if I do, then maybe his mom will be upset with him. But this is what the guys do in my office. Okay, so you see this. Okay, so this is, this is one of the DGENs in my office. If you, if you come to the office now, you'll see the shoes and you'll know who the guy is. He has a Louis Vuitton wallet. He has money. He has a, 
magic mushroom, multi, what's it called, microdoses. He's trading apes and he's watching a live poker game. Okay, now there are these people. Like, there are these people that need that much dopamine. Um, anyway, the people that are trading NFTs are now trading domains. They're trading ENS domains, so Ethereum name services domains. Okay, they're trying. They're trading domains. So remember, I said to you that with the new type of domains, the .dot ETH domains, the .dot NFT, the .dot crypto, the .dot Bitcoin, those domains are very, very, very special. Why? Because if you own them, number one, it's not like the old domains where you had to renew it every year. When you own the NFT, you've got the NFT in your wallet. The second thing is you can actually accept crypto on those domains. So if you own an, an, a dot ETH domain, say you own CryptoManRun.eth, right? And if you do, please give it to me because I really want it. I really, really want CryptoManRun.eth and obviously I don't want to negotiate with terrorists. It's super important that, if, that, that you have it because that is your, going to be the way that your business or, your, or you will be able to accept revenue from your customers. They can just pay from their wallet to a domain. Now, I always say to you guys, is we, one of the sponsors of our show is Unstoppable Domains. They don't do .eth, but they do do .crypto, .nft, .bitcoin, .zil. You need to register those domains because what we're seeing with .eth is that right now these guys are starting to trade the .eth domains and they're getting like six and seven and nine and 10 ETH for these domains. So they, they literally negotiating with terrorists. They've taken all the great names registered all the great names, bought it for very low amounts, $20, $30. And then what they're doing is they're now selling it to the people that want it and they're starting to trade. And those domains will become worth millions one day because if you're McDonald's and you want McDonald's.eth, you'll pay any amount of money to get that domain. And so that's why I keep saying to you, go and get the domains. There's a referral link below. If you don't want to support the channel, just go to Unstoppable Domains and, and, and do it without. If you do support the channel, I think you get 70% off or something. But register the domains because you never know who's going to need them. You pay $20 today or $30 today for your domain, right? And then once you've got it, it's yours and you can sell it to whoever needs to have it or you can just hold it for your business. Trust me, do this. I'm not telling you because they're show sponsors. I'm telling you because look at what these DGENs are trading. They are trading domain. They're trading apes and they're trading domain names. There are a bunch of apes trading domain names. That's what's going on here. All right, let's get into altcoins. Should we get into altcoins? Um... Yeah, okay, let's, let's, yeah. Do, yeah, people are trading domains. It's an NFT, they're trading domains. It blows my mind. Okay, let's, let's skip, let's skip all of this. Let's go to the fun stuff. I did tell you that Anchor Protocol got to $20 billion total value locked. And I did say to you guys yesterday that I wanted to discuss something with you. Because um, I think in, the, in, 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 in this kind of market, what it does is it has a very sobering effect on people. Like, in the bull market, you get very hyped. And you know, you, sometimes you start to believe the hype and you, know, you, you start to believe the people on Twitter, you start to believe the YouTube channels and you get dragged into this echo chamber of, of hype. But Joby says, what does microdosing do? C come to the banter offices, we'll, we'll, we'll set you up here. <laughs> um, but I think when, when you get into a down market and specifically when you get to a down market that has lasted this long and we've been in a six month down market and it seems to be continuing. There are certain truths that you have to accept. And I wanted to go through some of these truth, truths with you. Some of these truths with you. It comes from a tweet from Root25. And, you know, I don't like long threads because I've got terrible ADD and ADD doesn't allow me to read long threads. But he does say some things here which I really want to spend some time on. So we've got like 10 minutes. I want to spend 10 minutes on these things. These are probably the most important lessons that you're going to learn or, you know, right now, when you're in a sober mood, when you're not in the hype mood, these are going to make a lot of sense to you. So the first thing he says is, if history repeats itself again, 95% of the coins that made all-time high in 2021 will never hit a new time all-time high again and will probably die. So I went and looked at last uh, 2017. This is like pretty much around when Bitcoin was near the high. And I went and looked at the top 10 coins. And the top 10 coins in 2017 were Bitcoin Cash was there, Litecoin was there, IOTA was there, uh, NEM was there, Dash was there, Bitcoin Gold was there, okay, e EOS was in the top 12, and NEO was in the top 15, and Ethereum Classic was in the top 20. These are the top 20, uh, NXT. Now, if you look at the top 20 today, 
it's a very different picture. You can see that you know, EOS is nowhere to be found. Let's actually see where is EOS and where is NEO. Let's have a look here. So EOS, remember EOS was in the top 20. There number list there. I was, uh, no, I'll have my list. number 45, number 45. Uh, Neo, which was, Neo was like one of the darlings, yeah. is uh, today number, okay, hold on, let's, let's find it here. Let's see where it is. So Neo, it's number, doesn't even say what number it is, but it's very, very, very low down. And that got me thinking. The reason why that got me thinking was, what are the top 20 coins going to be a year from now, two years from now? Because if you know what they're going to be, you, you can start placing your bets. And so when you're thinking about what bets to make, you've got to start looking forward. And right now, we're, the market is basically telling you that we don't want a dream and a prayer, a hope and a prayer. We want adoption. The market is pricing in adoption and is willing to pay money for adoption. When you look at the top, um, let's look at the top 10 coins on CoinGecko. You can see that every single one of the top 10 coins, barring X, uh, XRP, has real world adoption. Bitcoin has adoption. Ethereum has so much adoption, it can't keep up. BNB, we know the story of BNB. Solana is now back over uh, Luna. We had Solana and Luna uh, inverted earlier today. But all of these are pricing for adoption. So when you're looking forward, look for tokens that actually have adoption and are getting adoption. The market's not going to reward blue sky concepts anymore. Those days are finished. Those days are finished. I want to carry on going through this. Um, I want to just wait. Let's just look at one or two other things. The other thing is, remember that the first generation of tokens probably isn't going to succeed. Generally, the first generation of tokens is going to have very good success initially. But then they're going to be replaced by a second generation of tokens. <clears throat> so I'll give you two examples. You think about Axie Infinity. Axie Infinity was the first generation of real NFT gaming. Here's the chart of Axie Infinity. So let's look at it. Let's zoom out. Went from pretty much nothing all the way up to $169. And it's now trading at $29. And if you look at the, 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 um, the chart of AOL, America Online, in, in the 2000 and something like that, what you'll see is that the price of AOL went up made a huge spike, but then it got replaced by a second generation that does exactly the same thing. Now, there are a lot of tokens today that do something amazing. Uh, I'll give an example. Stepin does something amazing. You've got to ask yourself a question as to whether the user experience is so good that the users will stay with Stepin forever. Stepin is just an example. I do love Stepin. I'm an investor of Stepin. Or whether they will, there will be a better company that does the same thing, and that's usually a good bet to be investing in. You can see the same thing. So look at that. Look at Peg Axie. So Peg Axie was the best game in the world. Now we're zero. Pretty much we're zero. Rest assured that some of the best concepts that we have today are going to be replaced by better iterations of the same concept. The, the creator of the first concept isn't the one that wins. It will, it will, they will, it will evolve. It will, it will become better. So that's the first thing. The second thing, let's carry on going through this tweet because I think this tweet is like, one of the best tweets I've, I've, I've read, really one of the best tweets that I've read. So he says, let's be honest, most DeFi protocols don't need a token. I don't want to argue with that. This is one that you really need to focus on. Whenever you see DeFi protocols that give you a high yield when you lock your coins for a long time, what that means, what, let me tell you what that means. If you missed out on step in, what I'm saying to you is there's going to be another step in which is going to overtake the current step in. Because that's what happens. There's going to be another Axie which overtakes the current Axie. Why? Because if you look at the Axie game, it was a great proof of concept. But the gameplay was shit. The gameplay was garbage. It was garbage. No one enjoyed it. The Philippines played it because they were making lots of money. But no one enjoyed playing Axie. It's not a fun game. But the concept is good. Okay? Same thing's going to happen. This one, number three, very important. Whenever you see a DeFi protocol that, that gives you longer returns for locking up the money, what that usually means is that the team is insecure about their growth. Now, what they do is they artificially say, look, there's too much selling pressure on our token, and we're not growing as fast as the selling pressure. Now, when you're not growing as fast as the selling pressure on your token, effectively your token price goes down. So what do they do? They say to you, hold on, in order to stop you from selling your token, what they say is lock it up for 12 months, 24 months, and we'll give you an insane return for locking it up. 
okay, what are they actually doing? They're insecure about their token price, which they actually shouldn't be worrying about. They should be worrying about getting adoption. And they're making you lock up your tokens and they're giving you and other people more tokens, which will effectively dilute your valuation anyway. So be super careful of any protocol that is telling you to lock up your tokens for longer to get so much. Next thing, if you spend time in the echo chambers on Twitter, you'll find yourself believing everything they say because you start believing the bullshit. You start believing the hype, which means that you should broaden your horizons. You should get out of Twitter and do your research elsewhere. Don't get into an echo chamber. If you follow all the lunar maxis on Twitter, you'll believe Luna is going to the moon. But if you, if you broaden your view and you follow the Bitcoin maxis, you may get a more balanced view. Got to be very careful of, of that. Um, this one is another one which I love. It says, crypto is an inefficient market compared to traditional markets. Okay. Alpha, which is early returns, can be found by being early. Now, what is being early? Being early means getting better information than the institutions from better places right now, which means what you've got to be doing is spending a lot of time researching because rest assured that right now, like I said, we have 500 days before this market becomes efficient. And when the market becomes efficient, you're not going to be able to make this alpha. So in the next 500 days, you really got to educate yourself and you really got to gain more knowledge than everyone else. And then you've got to trade on the knowledge because in 500 days, it's going to become efficient. And then all this, this alpha that you've got basically falls out the window. Um, yeah, he says the same thing. He says, play to earn games like Stepan are fun and addictive, but it's not sustainable. It may work well for several months, but eventually the music will stop because too many sneakers are minted. Exactly what happened to Axie Infinity. And again, I say, I love Stepan. It's just at a $20 billion valuation. I can't recommend that you guys buy it right now. I love the concept. I love Stepan. I love the team. I love everything about them. I'm not letting you guys buy it at $20 billion valuation. Um... If someone tells you that you can make 1% risk-free in DeFi, there is a catch. Remember, if you can't explain where the yield is coming from, the yield is actually coming from you. When you start bragging to your friends about how easy it is to make money, when you start sending screenshots to your friends about the money you're making, that's the time to start taking profits. All right, so that's what I wanted to show you guys today. Remember, we'll be back here soon. We'll be back here soon, a couple of hours, with the... Um, yeah, it's run fundamentals. We're bringing the fun into fundamentals. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. Uh, we're going to be here in, a, in about three and a half hours. Three and a half hours, we're going to be here watching Pile live. So join us. It'll be fun. Sheldino is also going to be here. Um, we're having a meetup at the office now. He's going to be here. Uh, I did want to show you one other thing quickly. Oh, I've got to give away $10,000. I'm going to give away $10,000 of CoinWeb. What is CoinWeb? CoinWeb is a cross-chain computation platform. It's a layer two that brings a whole lot of chains together. And effectively, you know, the problem with cross chains, in this case, they don't bridge the tokens, which is, which is amazing. So it's, it decouples the blockchains. It, you, you can have parallel executions of smart contracts, which really does give um, a different dimension. Now, we're giving away $10,000 of uh, CoinWeb tokens. How do you do it? One, you have to subscribe to the uh, Crypto Banter newsletter on the Crypto Banter website and comment in the, the, on the website. The other thing that you have to do is you have to go to our BBS, bbs.market, and comment. We are now the second biggest BBS in the world. We were the first. We want to get back our, our first place. So go there, comment. We'll be there. We'll give you guys giveaways. And then later on, I'm going to show you guys the new system for Bybit. Um, for those of you who don't know Bybit, one of my favorite exchanges, I'm not just saying that because they show sponsors. I didn't used to trade on Bybit, but I started trading on Bybit when they actually started having, they've got like these huge markets. They've got a whole lot of altcoins, which I never used to have in spot and in perpetual. So if you look at their spot markets, they've got everything, everything that you want. Um, they've got leverage. I don't recommend that you guys take leverage, but they've got so many altcoins with so many different pairs. So one of my favorite exchanges. Now, you know how it works. We've got this referral link in, in the description below. If you sign up with our referral link, then what we used to do is we used to 2x a portfolio and 10x a portfolio. Okay, that's where it gets interesting. We've developed a spinning wheel, or we are developing a spinning wheel, which what I'll do from now on is I will pick a winner, and then the wheel will spin, and it will have 1x, 2x, 5x, 10x, and 100x. So if you have got money in your account, we could 100x your account. It's going to be with a spinning wheel. The spinning wheel is almost developed. When it's developed, it's going to be amazing. So... Sign up with the link below. It's an amazing exchange. Uh, deposit money into your account. You don't have to trade. 
and you may actually get 100x of your portfolio. Imagine 100x on your portfolio. Insane. All right, I will see you guys again in three and a half hours. Until then, hopefully my voice gets better and you guys trade well, my friends. Fun show. Great. I wish I had a voice. I wish I had a hundred eggs for the spinning wheel. You can. The spinning wheel is nearly ready, bro. It's going to be super fun. Press a button. Imagine we're going to select an account and then we're going to press a button and it's going to go like spin around and it could be 1x, 2x, 5x, 10x, 100x. What about a thousand x? No, bro. I mean, a thousand x. The guys get $10,000 $10 in his account. He'll get 10. I can't do that.